Uh, we've brought in attorney Joe Ferretti from the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm. Joe, good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Joe. Yesterday, middle of the afternoon, I began receiving texts that Sheriff Nate Harmon was the subject of indictments that were being handed down by the special prosecutor involving the situation with his daughter, Carrie Harmon, that we all remember with the alleged uh, accident. Was it uh, drunk driving? Was it not? What have you? And uh, you may recall how that got kind of blown up pretty uh, hugely in the area. And uh, yesterday, some indictments were turned in by... Uh, I believe the special prosecutor, Dan James, out of Morgan County. Joe, you've had an opportunity to read through these indictments. Uh, can you address them? There are there are four counts. Uh, feel free to read verbatim or interpret as you uh, present each one of those here. Uh, yeah, Rob, we're glad to do that. And before we do it, let, let's uh, preface any comments or uh, statements we make this morning, uh, as we want to do often on this radio show, uh, you know, we're going to be talking about indictments. These are these are charges that uh, have been formally charged against the sheriff. But uh, as we've learned, have people following the issues with the with the former president, uh, these indictments are nothing more than notice to a defendant that uh, there are formal charges pending. Uh, the defendant always has a chance to respond, and and we always caution people to wait to see uh, what the response will be, whether there'll be a plea of guilty or not guilty uh, entered by the defendant, and then where the investigation goes from there. So uh, while these charges are on file at the Berkeley County Clerk's Office, uh, it's still all in the nature of things very preliminary. So having said that, um, and it's always difficult, by the way, Robin and, and Bill, you know this, and when you know the personality involved, it's it's difficult uh, to address these subjects sometimes. So we'll we'll do our best here. But, Indeed, we we all um, know Nate, and we've had great relationships yeah. with him. Exactly. Uh, so bottom line is, this is from that January sixth incident where his daughter, a uh, Carrie Harmon, age twenty two, was involved in a motor vehicle wreck. And it's important to remember the background of that. And very quickly, I'll touch on that. Uh, a deputy, William Henderson responded to the call of a single vehicle accident and he arrived there started an investigation he was running his body cam because remember we all saw the body cam footage uh later on when when uh, sheriff Harmon appeared on the show and uh the deputy did an investigation and then the sheriff arrives on scene in plain clothes and he questions the officer about the investigation questions whether or not his daughter had been drinking and then goes over to the daughter's car uh, to, as he claimed, report on uh, the presence of a GPS tracker that he had affixed to the car. Uh, and we didn't know what happened to the tracker and all that, but uh, that's what the, the sheriff had claimed he had done at the scene. The report was then filed. Uh, a warning was issued to Carrie Harmon. Uh, there were no charges brought. It's just a warning uh, for basically failure to maintain control since there were no injuries or other cars involved in the accident. So that's the background. But that's important to understand because these charges now concern that investigation. Count one, obstruction of a law enforcement officer. And the count there is that the sheriff interfered with, uh, not feloniously, which is where we'll talk about in a minute, but through threats, menaces, or acts, or otherwise, did illegally hinder or obstruct a police officer in the lawful discharge of his duties. And that concerns that Deputy Henderson, who responded to the scene. And there's a code section in West Virginia that deals directly with that. It is a misdemeanor count. Count two is obstruction of a law enforcement officer. And that concerns, again, the sheriff allegedly threatening or otherwise hindering or obstructing an officer in discharge of their duties by deleting or concealing the GPS tracking data that was available from the tracking device that he had placed on his daughter's car. Again, that is a misdemeanor charge under West Virginia Code 61-5-17. Third count, uh, 
providing false information to a state trooper. Now, it's important to know what happened here. Remember that within two weeks of this investigation of this January 6th auto accident involving the sheriff's daughter, our prosecutor, Katie Wilkes Delegati, referred this case to a special prosecutor because we understand that she works with the sheriff all the time in law enforcement endeavors, thought it was important for public confidence and transparency to have somebody else come in and take a look at this whole thing. So it goes to Dan James, who is the prosecutor in Morgan County. He becomes a special prosecutor. He conducts an investigation and he gets the support of the local state police detachment to help him in the investigation. And count three concerns an allegation that the sheriff provided false information to a a West Virginia state trooper by reporting to the trooper that a preliminary breathalyzer test was not administered at the scene to carry Harmon. Remember, there were some concerns about whether or not that had been done, and the, the sheriff represented to the state police one had not been done and now that this is a, a, a subject of a, an indictment, uh, apparently there's evidence that one was done, and the sheriff falsely reported that to the state police. Finally, count four, uh, again, providing false information to a state trooper, and this concerns that GPS tracking data because in their investigation of this, and I'm talking about the state police, they did not have access to the GPS tracking data and the allegation is that the sheriff has either, uh, you know, got that information and, and is keeping it somewhere else or has deleted it and making it unavailable to law enforcement folks. So bottom line, we got four counts. They are all misdemeanor counts, uh, but they were presented to the grand jury and the grand jury returned this indictment yesterday, October 17th. Joe, uh, in regards to them being misdemeanor counts, as opposed to something that's felonious. A misdemeanor Mm -hmm. count is obviously a much less serious charge than a felony. Any idea what the penalties would be in a situation like this for misdemeanor counts of this nature? Yes, because, uh, Rob, I I know exactly what the penalties can be, uh, because, again, there's two West Virginia Code sections that are cited as the basis for these four counts uh, in the indictment. And uh, the, the penalties are... Uh, a monetary fine that could range from 50 to $500 for the obstruction charges and 25 to $200 for providing false information to a state trooper. There's also potential for jail time, which is typical for a misdemeanor charge. Uh, you can't have more than a year in jail time levied against the defendant. And that is true for the obstruction charges. For the providing false information to the state trooper charges, the jail time is up to 60 days in jail. So those are the potential penalties here if there is a conviction on these counts. When you take the four charges, and we're leapfrogging here, but uh, when they, when they let, let's just take this specific situation out of, the, out of the equation and just take any case where there be multiple misdemeanor charges, do they add all these up to come up with a sentence, or do they take the most severe of the penalties and apply that one? Well, it, it depends on, on what is typical in any uh, case where there's a conviction. Okay, there's a pre-sentence report that's done, you know, investigation is done about the defendant's background, whether there's prior uh, criminal offenses, either charged or convicted. Uh, a lot of circumstances go into deciding an appropriate sentence. So in this particular case, with the, the subject being a law enforcement officer himself, um, you know, there, there will be inclinations by a sitting judge to perhaps, uh, even with a clean background and record and no prior convictions and things of that nature, there may be a, a um, inclination on the part of a judge in sentencing to be a little bit more harsh because of the public trust issue that is raised whenever a law enforcement official is involved in criminal activity. I just know from the, my past and, and following certain cases, uh, law enforcement officials who have been convicted of crimes are uh, sometimes treated uh, pretty severely by judges. 
because of the violation of public trust. I mean, this is an elected official. He takes an oath. Uh, and then if he's convicted, uh, the message from the court system has to be, uh, you know, they're higher, held to a little higher standard here if you're a law enforcement officer facing criminal charges. So, uh, I, you know, a lot goes into that equation, Rob, and it would be hard to pinpoint uh, what potential sentence could be out there whether it would involve any jail time at all. But uh, if I'm a law enforcement official and I'm charged with crimes, I'd be concerned about the sentencing stage. Joe, the grand jury indictment just means that there's enough evidence the grand jury felt that it could proceed to a trial. It doesn't imply innocence or guilt once again. Absolutely. Uh, And we need to make that clear. Uh, The defendant has an opportunity to defend on any and all of these charges. Uh, I suspect there will be a defense in this case. Um, so we have to wait and see how this, how the investigation goes and what defenses will be raised. But, um, you know, the bottom line is there, there are, even with these charges pending right now, there are implications for not only the sheriff's department, but the county as a whole. I mean, you got your top law enforcement officer now uh, facing a four count indictment. Uh, you can understand the ripple effect that's going to take place in Berkeley County. Joe, going back to Article 5, Section 17A, is there a provision in this article uh, for both a uh, felony and a misdemeanor indictment, and it was left up to the grand jury which of the two they wanted to go with? No, I, there isn't. This is under that code section. It is uh, plainly just a misdemeanor okay. charge. And my guess is... And, and, Understand in the grand jury process, the prosecutor, prosecuting attorney, and in this case, that's Dan James, uh, they, they control that process. Oftentimes, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go where the grand jury leads them, and, and there will be an alternative uh, option for a grand jury to, to find either misdemeanor or felony. Uh, but in this particular case, uh, I, I have to believe that uh, given the nature of the allegations here, and uh, the circumstances behind this involving uh, the sheriff and his daughter, and uh, and given his position in the county, uh, my guess is, and I don't know this, I wasn't on the inside working this, but my guess is that some consideration was given to whether any of this conduct rises to the level of a felony, and it was decided that uh, it does not. So it was presented to the grand jury as misdemeanors. And by the way, Bill, it, it's a little bit unusual to have misdemeanors presented to a grand jury. Uh, typically, uh, the way things go in, in, at the county level is misdemeanors are presented to the magistrate court uh, in the way of a, of a complaint or a warrant, uh, and then the magistrate uh, notifies the defendant that there's a, uh, a misdemeanor charge out there, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a formal process, but at the magistrate court level. Um, but my guess is that the decision was made by Dan James as a special prosecutor that given the circumstances here, it was appropriate to have these charges vetted by a grand jury, even though they're misdemeanors, and to have a grand jury return an indictment on misdemeanors. Uh, and that's, uh, I'm sure, with a nod towards having a, a process in place to show that uh, there's been a proper vetting of these charges and, and that the grand jury had a chance to hear from uh, some of these witnesses who, who testified to, uh, to better understand the allegations involving the sheriff's conduct and to decide whether or not it was appropriate for a grand jury to return an indictment. I think that whole process was put in place with these misdemeanor charges because it was a sheriff. Yeah, uh, that surprised me as well because I was thinking most misdemeanors came through the magistrates. Uh, let me ask another question. I, I think I know the answer based upon your first one, uh, but uh, count three and four cite a different charge. Uh, chapter 15, Article 2, Section 16, uh, both uh, three and four cite that. I assume that particular section of the code also is directed toward a misdemeanor as opposed to giving the provision or the alternative of a felony. Is that correct? That, that, that's correct. Yeah. Generically speaking, it's just lying to an investigating officer. Yeah. And in this case, it was a state trooper who was uh, uh, being utilized by Dan James to investigate this. And and by the way, the, the, those it's under you can see the dates of these alleged instances uh, of uh, 
criminality. Uh, the investigation was taking place in the summertime. You know, the accident was in January, but the state troopers were involved in investigating this in the summertime, and the counts three and four involved conduct that took place, I believe, in July. Uh, and, and so, obviously, the, at that point, uh, the, the trooper was inquiring of the sheriff of certain information, and uh, the representations are, through this indictment, that he was not truthful with his information he provided. Yeah, Joe, I'm going to ask a, probably an unfair question, but you can always say I don't, I, sh- I should not answer it. Uh, looking at this, uh, uh, the incident and the charges, uh, was there another section, another part of the code that these could equally have been uh, uh, utilized that would have been a more severe penalty, being felony as opposed to misdemeanor? Yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that, Bill, because uh, I, I wasn't researching other sections of the of the code uh, when we just got this indictment this morning. Uh, so I was only able to look at the code sections that are actually cited in the indictment. Uh, I suspect there are other code sections that could be implicated here when you are obstructing an officer. But I, I, I think the bottom line here is that the underlying crime, OK, if one was committed by uh, the sheriff's daughter, that is also a misdemeanor. So uh, I suspect had had the uh, information that was uh, uh, that could have been obtained regarding the daughter's accident, had that risen to a higher level of criminality, had that been a felony, for example, and the sheriff uh, allegedly did things to cover up information that would have led to a prosecution of his daughter. Uh, I think the charges against the sheriff would have been perhaps elevated. But given the underlying uh, subject matter was a misdemeanor itself, I think that that to be consistent, I'm sure the special prosecutor looked at that and said, perhaps misdemeanors are appropriate also in the obstruction of that investigation. Uh, probably another unfair question, Joe, to you, since you've only had a chance to look at it for a couple of minutes. Uh, where do we go from here? Uh, will the sheriff be able to stay on duty? Should he be suspended? Uh, will it be everything uh, a business as usual? Uh, what is your sense? What happens next? Boy, you know, we, we, we've been pondering that question for about uh, 10 minutes now, yeah. and, and I, I wonder at this point. I, I think uh, – Given past history, we can expect the sheriff to come forth with some sort of statement uh, to the media uh, about these charges and, and what his intentions are in defense of those charges, uh, whether or not he intends to stay on the job. Uh, but I, I suspect also that some of the uh, county government leaders in Berkeley County are going to have to get together. And I'm talking about uh, the prosecuting attorney and county counsel. Uh, are going to have to get together and review this situation and see if it is untenable for the sheriff to stay on at this point in time or if uh, it's appropriate to uh, ride this out a little bit and let the investigation continue, let the sheriff offer his defenses and see where that goes. Uh, or, or, you know, the, sh- the sheriff might consider taking a temporary leave of absence and appoint his chief deputy to run the uh, department. There's a lot of options here, uh, the implications of which I've not – Uh, thought fully through, but I suspect some of the leaders in Berkeley County are going to be having those discussions. And uh, just a clarification, uh, Kevin Plummer was the uh, special prosecutor that was on this case. Uh, uh, Dan James is the prosecuting attorney in Morgan County. Kevin Plummer would have been the person who was assigned uh, to it out of Morgan County, from what I understand. Um, Oh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, he he was the, the lead investigator, but then uh, Dan James is the one that signs off on everything, reviews everything, and, and probably was, uh, I, I suspect, was was one of the presenters before the grand jury. Uh, Joe, any final thoughts or uh, uh, any uh, thing to wrap on this up here? Well, uh, look, it, it always gives you pause when uh, your top law enforcement officer is, is facing criminal charges himself. And uh, so there's reason to be concerned. Uh, there's reason to uh, wonder about the implications for the county going forward now. Uh, but as with any uh, criminal defendant who is uh, subject of an indictment, uh, it, 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 it certainly is important to understand that uh, a lot yet is still to be developed in terms of uh, defenses that can be offered to this and explanations as to uh, uh, whatever information the sheriff provided or did not provide 
uh, to the investigator. So, uh, you know, as we always caution, it's a wait and see approach. Joe, thank you very much. Appreciate your expertise in, uh, in the law this morning. Okay, fellas. Take care. Thanks, Joe. Joe's back on uh, Friday for the Friday panel. And this segment of our program today brought to you in part by our friends at the Mansion Ferretti Law Firm. That includes the aforementioned Joe Ferretti. Also by Wayne Clark and the Locust Hill Golf Course, where they've got a new membership drive going on right now. You can save $500 and get the rest of this year and all.